What is up, Earth Noids and Space Noids? I am just a simple new type. And in this episode, we are returning to Mobile Suit Moon Gundam. Last time, the Raw Gills departed with the Razaim and Yuta and the crew heads to Earth to transport Minerva. On Moon Moon, Luce has taken control of the colony while Sarasa and her people resist. This time, Yuta will yell at Minerva for something that happened before she was alive. The Atalante 3 crew cut off the Raw Gills, and the informant hiding on the Atalante 3 causes trouble. So let's get into this. Mari continues telling Yuta about the colony drop, but she also tells him how Xeon also killed their own. She explains that there was a hierarchy among the space noids. They attack other sides with the exception of Side 6, which declared neutrality during all of this. Side 7 was also neutral, but that didn't last long. Yuta originally doesn't believe it, but he thinks back to a time when Agos told him that Xeon lost the trust of the space noids. The princess will never be like that. She also explains how the Zabis bastardized the concept of the new type created by Xeon and used it to divide the world. Even after the war, Meneva's name was used to create Neo Zeon, and another colony drop occurred. Mari says that Meneva has come to terms with who she is. She has accepted it. If you feel the same way, then certainly he must agree with her. She continues to make Yuta feel bad about just learning history, and he runs out. At that time, Safira is passing by and sees Yuta is upset. She asks Mari what happened, and she tells Safira she told him the truth. We learn that Mari is a former Zeon. She says that killing is wrong and that all fighting should be done through politics. But then she bitterly says that she thinks that that is the least that she could do as a former Zeon, though she doesn't use those exact words. Safira, without skipping a beat, chokes Mari and tells her that this righteousness only makes her look like a child. Hell yeah, Safira doesn't mess around. As Safira floats away, Mari cries. We flash back to the end of the first Neo Zeon War in UC 0089. Haman soldiers are fighting Glimmy soldiers, even though there is a ceasefire and Haman and Glimmy are dead. Some of these Zeon soldiers include Klaus and Ansgar. That is when EFF and the AU come in with their backup. There is nothing they could do. That is when Funnels begin taking out EFF. It is Luce Krangle and his dad doll. He tells all of the remaining Zeon members to fall back with him and his guasha. No Zeon soldier has seen this ship before. If you are following our coverage of 0083 Rebellion, we saw the power vacuum created after the One Year War, which fractured Zeon's strength. When Glimmy and Haman died, Luce didn't waste any time and took command. He sealed that power vacuum quicker than Spooge sealing a colony hole. Remember, Luce is a third generation Zeon. They treat Zeonism the same way that Christians treated the Crusades. All ships follow the Guasha with the exception of one, the Atalante II. The captain of the Guasha hails the rogue ship, but it is met with their first officer, Exo Gennaro. Gennaro wants to go back to Core 3 to help all the poor mining children. Many of the miners on Core 3 were born and raised on Axis. She says she has to try to save them, or else. She hesitates. Luce chimes in and says, Ugh, we know you will go to hell. We all know what you're talking about. We don't have time for your emotional religion. Last episode, we learned that Gennaro and father ran a church and orphanage together. Now's the time to pull back. But before she listens to his orders, father and his Dovin wolf says to Gennaro that the children are waiting. Ansgar, Klaus, and Oval join them along with 130 soldiers to help save as many people as possible. However, Klaus, Ansgar, Oval, and Father are the only people who survive. She bears the burdens of their deaths, but because of their sacrifice, they were able to save the children of Core 3. Luce doesn't reprimand her for her actions. Luce seems to know how Gennaro functions and says that the burden of losing all of the men is enough suffering and really uses her dead comrades to pressure her to continue to fight for Xeon. The children on the Church of Palau were the ones to give Gennaro the dolphin pendants. As she leaves to serve Zeon once again, she gives one to Father. In the present, Father holds her and tells her that he is just a priest in disguise and that he is really just trying to save his own soul. Let me tell you, this priest hottos and he hottos hard. Oval briefs the team on the bridge. The Raw Gills is traveling around a debris field to head to Earth. The Atalante 3 will go through the field in order to cut them off. Oval will scout the debris field with the Gazgrau BB, while Agos and Klaus heads out in the Agjin. Yuta talks to Minerva, but Safira runs on the bridge and tells Captain Laro not to let that emotionally unstable boy talk to her in his current state. Meanwhile, a mysterious person gets a new mission and deletes the logs. Yuta yells at Minerva. He thought that he knew her. Minerva cuts him off and tells him that everything is recorded in this room. He tries to force understanding between the two, but that isn't how it works. She simply responds that it was for the greater good. 
Yuta yells, asking if her grandfather was for the greater good and floats out. Sephira is waiting on the outside and asks if he's okay. She reminds Yuta that unless you are a new type, it takes time to understand others. She also reminds him that the events of Operation British happened before she was even born. The life she has is thrusted upon her, and she never had the chance to properly grow up. Sapphira says behind that door is someone who probably has a heart that is more broken than you, and that he should understand that. Yuta says, is it because he is a new type? Sephira says, no, it is because you are a man. Sephira is on fire in this episode. Yuta is starting to realize that he is the one that screwed up. Oval talks to Gennaro discreetly. He thinks that he may have figured out who the mole was. When leaving Moon Moon, he worked with First Officer Ebe to create a program that would transfer all data to a secondary terminal if any log files were deleted. He set up a hidden camera to capture this when it happens. He gives a photo to Gennaro, who can't believe it. T-60 minutes until the mission begins. Klaus watches Agos talk to Father about the adjin. Father says that the arm thrusters make for perfect binders. He is still confused on why this choice of mobile suit. He asks Father why he became a priest. He says after the incident at Core 3, he looked at mobile suits differently. He starts asking Agos about his past and how cyber new type memories can be altered. He wonders who his master is. Klaus intervenes and tells Father not to bug Agos before an important mission. He tells Agos not to trust Father and says that he has his back. He doesn't say that to everyone. Hey, he's finally considered a part of the team. Ovo and Gennaro wonder what they should do. This is the perfect opportunity to bring them in, but they can't afford to cut off the mission and lose Minerva. Just like Core 3, she is once again left wondering if she should go against her orders. Father goes to find Gennaro, but stumbles into the comm rooms to see a missile going off. Father says it all makes sense. Everyone on the ship is informed of the missile launch. No one knows where the authorization came from. We see blood in Father's glasses floating as a mysterious man floats away. Well, the cat is out of the bag, and they have to press forward. The Raw Gills knows they are coming. At the Raw Gills, they are certain it is the Atalante 3. They prep for an attack. Saphir and Captain Laro are concerned. They don't get why they would sacrifice their life going through the space debris, only to give away their location. Safira contacted the informant when she was a prisoner on board Neozian's ship. She believes there is no reason for him to give away his identity, but she felt a coldness coming from him. He certainly isn't an ally that can be trusted. The Raw Gills approaches Earth's gravity. This makes things even more difficult for Gennaro. She's going to have to send her team out and play right into the informant's hand. Safira learns that a Papua class is following the Atalante 3. She requests to change up her loadout to the missile launcher. Mari tells her to get back safely, which is her way of apologizing. Safira tells Murray to expect long-range attacks. This is going to be a tough one. Before launching, Murray talks a big game. But Ubaldo gets on the comm and yells at him and tells him to respect Safira's orders. Ubaldo tells Safira that he has a bad feeling and to get back safely. Wait, how is Ubaldo talking directly to a mobile suit from the med bay? This isn't Star Trek where you could divert power and communications to wherever you want. What are the security protocols? How does this work under Minoski particle dispersion? I'm getting sidetracked. But these are the questions that keep me up at night. Safira launches in the Rajizid for the first time. While Yuta wonders what he is fighting for, Safira takes on a missile barrage from the Atalante 3. Oval guides Agos and Klaus out in the Agjins. While prepping, Klaus tells Agos about Earth's gravity well. He says, yeah man, you make one wrong move and it just pulls you in. It consumes you, then engulfs you in flames. Oval tells Klaus not to freak out Agos. The two head out and engage with the Jettas. Meanwhile, Oval is sniping in the Gazgrau BB. The AMX 117LG Gazgrau BB is the fusion of the Gaz L Grau and the Gaz R Grau. It has a 6 2 missile launcher on both shoulders as well as double the shield. Other weapons include two beam sabers, a high energy output heat lance, and the long range rifle of the Gaz L Grau. So this line of half mobile suits have finally become a full mobile suit. Congratulations! Oval shoots at Saphira while the Agjins approach behind another missile barrage. She goes in and attacks Oval. He is struggling but able to keep up with her. Saphira wonders where Agos is, not realizing that the Agjins are approaching from behind. Agos detaches his propellant. He does a few flips and hops onto the Raw Gills. He has some real Kirby energy going on. Agos starts by taking out the turrets. Captain Laro recalls the mobile suits to back up the Klopp class ship, but they have their hands full with the missile barrage. Agos heads into the hangar and cuts off all the power to the lower decks. He took over the ship before and now knows how to neutralize it. 
Below the ship, Klaus gets out of his action and accesses a control panel on the keel of the ship. He sends a Morse code message to Minerva and heads to the mobile suit deck immediately. There is no power, so she is able to leave quite easy. No guards or anything? Okay, sure, why not? Important mission, no guards. I'm getting distracted again. Minerva is able to make her escape while Agos distracts the team. While Agos is causing a distraction, Yuta attacks him in Moon Gundam. They have a Mexican standoff on the deck of the ship. Yuta can feel a strange sensation pulling him. That's gravity, Yuta. It sucks. That is when Klaus comes in with his Agjin, doing his best bowling ball cosplay as he knocks Yuta off the raw gills. Yuta gets sucked up by Earth's gravity well. And that will do it for this episode. The story really tries hard at making you think that Father is the informant, which was obvious it wasn't going to be him. But who will it be? Next time, we will learn who the informant is. Moon Gundam gets its version of the re-entry fight scene that is prevalent in many series, and Father will bear the sins of all of his children, just like our Lord and Savior, Kira Yamato. But that will do it for now, new types. Remember, don't yell at girls for things that happened before they were born. Peace.